Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this IWFM web webinar. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at uh, workplace and FM as a career of choice. I'm pleased to say that I'm joined by a panel of guest speakers uh, who will look at routes into workplace and, and FM uh, and talk you through some of the initiatives uh, we as an institute have launched to promote workplace and FM as a profession of choice. Uh, so I'm pleased to say today I'm joined by Sophie Hooper, who is IWFM Senior Policy Advisor. Uh, she'll talk through the work that we are doing with the Department of Work and Pensions. Uh, we're joined by Linda House Manis. Uh, Chief Executive of AWFM, uh, who will be speaking about our Schools Engagement Programme, uh, which we launched during uh, World FM Day this week. Uh, we're joined by Carolyn Lewis, who is a visiting lecturer and research assistant at the University College of London, and will be speaking about uh, academic routes into FM. Uh, we're also joined by Adrian Raby, who is Chief Executive of the British Training Board, and he'll talk about pathways for those leaving the military uh, into roles within workplace and FM. So the intention is that this is an interactive session. We have got a packed programme today, uh, but there will be the opportunity for you to ask questions of our panel. Uh, if you do have any questions to ask, please submit them uh, via the questions section uh, on the panel that you should see on the right hand side of your screen. I'm just going to talk briefly uh, about uh, World FM Day. So 15th of May on Wednesday uh, was World FM Day, uh, which saw the profession uh, trending globally on Twitter, which was great, um, kind of based on all the social media activity that was going on with uh, events during the day. We also partnered uh, with uh, DWP to take over their Job Centre Plus Twitter account to, to promote careers in workplace and FM. So uh, gave us a great opportunity to, to reach out to, to more people uh, within industry um, through the uh, Job Centre Plus Twitter account. During the week, we also launched a number of new reports and guidance to help support the pr profession. Um, one. Key one was the Pay and Prospects Service, so we're pleased to reveal uh, the results for our Pay and Prospects 2018-19 uh, survey are now available, uh, following responses from 467 workplace and facilities professionals who shared their views on pay benefits and future plans within our industry. Uh, the findings paint a positive picture in terms of CPD opportunities, the benefits of the, the IWFM qualifications and membership, salary levels and future expectations for the profession. Uh, the survey is in its 14, 14th year, uh, continues to build on the knowledge gained from the salary survey in previous years. The survey's purpose is to identify trends in pay, working conditions and prospects for new and existing workplace and facilities management professionals. Uh, we use the trend data gained over the last 13 years to help us provide the industry with a detailed picture of current working conditions within the sector and emerging trends, as well as to track future changes. For in-depth coverage, keep an eye on our industry magazine facilitates online column and, and June's edition for uh, their analysis uh, of the survey. Uh, some other highlights from uh, World FM Week was um, a number of our, our volunteers attended schools to present to key stage three pupils on workplace and FM. Uh, as I mentioned before, Linda House Manis, our, our chief executive, attended one of these events uh, and will provide it feedback on her experience uh, later on during the webinar. So I'm pleased to say uh, that's enough from me. So I'll hand over to my colleague, Sophie Hooper if the technology will work. Sophie, you should now be in control. <laughs> I'm not quite in control yet, I think. <laughs> I am in control, apparently. <laughs> and there I am. That's a lovely feeling, by the way. Um, the partnership with DWP, uh, one that we renewed in 2018. Uh, by way of introductions, there are really two key questions. Why are we doing this partnership and why have we chosen to work with the DWP specifically? So why we are doing this, it's very obvious. It's talked about lots. There is a skills gap in the industry. Um, our own business confidence monitor in 2018 picked that up uh, and 47% of our respondents cited that skilled trades are the biggest shortage and second is professional managers with 31%. Um, 
But really, there is a lack of up-to-date and robust sector-wide data relating to the skills facing the core and wider facilities management sector, which is why we are taking a number of initiatives to get that um, evidence-based insight. We've commissioned the labour market study, and we will also build on that through doing more skills-related surveys in the coming months. But despite the lack of, of wider and, and core data, we do know about the trends. Uh, the government's recent um, employer skills survey showed really that 51% uh, of people are finding it much more difficult to recruit employees with the right skills compared to five years ago. And other surveys, um, ACAS did a survey uh, not too long ago of which they published the results in, in January. Um, six in 10 employees say that finding skilled candidates is the biggest concern about the future of their business. And another um, insight that we've got is that some of the worst hit sectors are exactly those that are the productivity enhancing STEM related sectors, including most of the professions in the built environment, such as FM. And there is obviously a great cost impact to that skills gap. Um, the government's own industrial strategy, and there is a construction uh, sector deal that is linked to that, is likely to be significantly weakened, with skill shortages increasing and output reducing by at least 3.3 billion over the next five years. So that's quite a significant uh, impact on UK PLC. But also the Open University 2017 Business Barometer Survey points out other costs. Uh, the recruitment process takes much longer for 75% of employers. It causes inflated salaries to attract that talent. And um, temporary staffing um, costs are also much higher than what would be necessary if the skills gap was plugged. And that's all against the background of, you know, unforeseen, unseen unemployment rates for quite some time. Um, and people are unreluctant to move uh, in jobs because of the continued Brexit uncertainty. So why have we chosen to work with the DWP and continue our partnership? And um, as you can see on the screen, uh, I've shared a screenshot of our partnership commitments. And together we've got that shared agenda on increasing the routes into raising skills and professionalism of all those working in the facilities and workplace management industry across the UK. Um, so DWP very much realised the importance of the profession and the sector with that links to that, um, especially because they are very big employers. So the DWP want to engage with uh, that sector much better because of the profession's accessibility and roots into it, uh, which is why they are also uh, helping us with on World FM Day to raise the prospects of, of the profession. Um, so they are a stakeholder that help in amplifying the voice of that profession and its wider industry and employers. And as such, they are leveraging our work through the different platforms that they have. Um, and you will see there they've got a number of structured platforms in place. Um, and one that's actually not mentioned there is wider government. Because of our engagement with the DWP, we can also reach other departments demonstrating what we are doing for the profession, raising the profile of the professions in those other departments so that they take it into account when they uh, develop policy. So the DWP, there's a misconception that very often it's just the unemployed. Um, but they have got a schools network and careers advisors that are trying to uh, leverage different professions. Um, they also do a lot around increasing people's uh, capabilities on pre-employability and so they work with a lot of employers on that. And also one thing that's very often overlooked is the impact of um, universal credit and what that will mean for the future of the people that they are meant to be servicing. So in future, there are going to be a lot more people within their remit that are actually in job, but they may be part time. So it's going to be increasingly important as an employer to engage with the DWP um, and, and their job centres because they will just be servicing a lot more people. And so the, that pool of skilled people that they have access to will increase. Um, 
Next slide. Oh, uh, my slides have gone. The who and the what, really. So this slide is about who we will be targeting over the next few years as audiences and what we are doing. So um, in first instance, our current focus is on children and that's something that Linda will talk about much more next. So we are working with Class of Your Own on a schools engagement program. And I've also got a picture of the worksheet of the project that is being delivered. Um, and really the, um, the work that we are doing on the schools program is also meant to be raising the profile of the profession and wider interest industry so as to attract new entrants, um, which is part of the reason why we're very much um, understanding that parents are a secondary audience because they might be looking for a career change, etc. But we also do a lot wider work to attract new people um, into the profession and we give people tools to come into this career through the many different study programs that we and our partners provide. Um, for graduates, we are uh, exploring how we can bring them into our organization a lot more in a lot more structured work and Caroline will be talking a little bit more about the program that she does. Um, as far as the unemployed and skilled universal credit uh, people are going about, um, we are engaging with, they will become an increasingly more important target audience and in the past the DWP does not just support us with doing uh, some Twitter days. They also in help competitions that offer some short courses uh, that we provide. Um, return to work and career changes is, is not so much something that we're, we're currently focusing over, over and above the, the ongoing work that's going on. I've got a picture of um, the logo of Building People there. Building People is an initiative in its infancy and we are supporting this initiative which is meant to become an online platform that aspires to sit across the built environment and wants to connect uh, people, basically all those different target audiences trying to find a career in the built environment with actual opportunities and what they will also collect are all the different courses that are in there where there are work experiences and so they will be offering a very tailored service moving forward in the future connecting people with all those different opportunities. Um, what are we doing on service leavers? Adrian will talk a little bit more about the work that we are already doing to support service leavers of which there are about 20,000 a year. They've got fabulous um, skills that are really transferable for our profession and so we really need to uh, do a bit more to attract those people in the um, in the profession. Um, I've also put the logo of the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education in there because I just wanted to demonstrate that that's one of those other tools to get more people into an FM career because Fraser and his team for many years now have been working hard to ensure that we've got a range of FM apprenticeships available which are a, a beautiful alternative uh, and allows people to pursue that career while working and studying at the same time. And it, it's meant to be supporting social mobility a lot more to make sure that it, it is uh, a profession that is truly accessible for all. Um, one of the other groups that I haven't spoken about is the disability groups. It's, we're very much aware that that is something that needs to be supported much more in the workplace. And, and that's one of the groups that we will be targeting in future as well. But for now, we just want to make sure that we properly embed uh, the schools program and that we um, really focus also on the service lever program that we've developed with Adrian. And, um, make sure that those really work before we move on to any other focuses. And that's really the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, we seem to have lost Fraser. So I'm gonna be taking over as host for the moment and hopefully he can join us back online. Uh, thank you, Sophie. Um, 
That was brilliant. Thank you for uh, sharing with us all the work we're doing with DWP and sort of going into depth on that. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass control to Linda. So bear me two seconds. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, great to be with you uh, on this final day of World FM Week. Um, I know Sophie's um, gone through a lot of the work that we've done with DWP and in sort of some ways I'm going to sort of take us backwards insofar as looking at ways that what we're doing to inspire the next generation of workplace and FM leaders and this is quite close to my heart um, this initiative um, because for years now and, it, and this is not just in the FM industry I have to say this is wholesale across most industries no industry is saying they've got a glut of highly skilled uh, individuals uh, and, and if um, it's, it, there's fallen or foul of that as well so we've got we've got something called the demographic time bomb UK leads the world in the delivery of FM but the majority you know, when I look at our landscape of our members and, and, and people who also are not our members, but this is the industry at large. Those highly skilled, highly experienced people are sort of coming towards the end of their careers. And therefore, what are we doing? We have to do something. And therefore, what are we going to do to attract young people into this world called workplace and facilities management? Um, the majority of people you know, I speak to, you know, they fell into FM, they were usually around the age of about 35, they came from a sort of another profession, another industry, or one day they just were given the title of facilities manager. And we can't take that risk, we can't take that risk of just waiting and hoping and praying that there's another group of 35 year olds who are about to become the leaders. We have to start nurturing and developing that talent quite early on. So this week, uh, on the 15th of May, on Wednesday, which was World FM Day, uh, which um, Sophie alluded to earlier, um, we ran two pilots, one in Manchester and one in London. And there you can sort of see a couple of images from sort of both groups. Um, and I sort of made sure I sort of gate crashed the uh, London school visit and uh, presented uh, to myself trying to bring it to life and what I did with this, those young people was talk about the sort of Marks and Spencers because you know they would have all heard about Marks and Spencers but talk about how that organization uh, became carbon neutral um, for an, uh, an initiative by the then uh, CEO Stuart Rose um, who was so empowered by a film that he saw an inconvenient truth that he sort of charged the board with you know making Marks and Spencers different and and they did, but it was the FM team, it was the people who worked in the facilities management team made that happen. Um, so I wanted to bring that to life to the children to see that this is a really dynamic and exciting and vibrant profession to sort of um, enter into. So as you can see, that was, we were very busy on Twitter, obviously throughout the week, but particularly on Wednesday. And I have to say, there's a a huge shout out goes out to us of volunteers, mm. Mark Whitaker in Manchester. Uh, Chris Jeffers and Laura Birnbaum uh, in London, who gave up their days willingly to sort of um, present to the young people and to share their experiences and, and bring the whole programme to life. So what is this school's programme that we're sort of talking about today? Um, it's been created in partnership with a, a student engagement consultancy, which you saw on Sophie's uh, slide, called uh, A Class of Your Own. And it's um, a, a programme which allows our volunteers, our great ambassadors to go into schools and present to key stage three children, 11 to 14 year olds, on what this workplace and facilities management profession is all about. And hoping that those who inspire those young people to sort of go back and talk to their parents uh, about maybe what an opportunity looks like. Uh, so our volunteers were speaking on behalf of the profession, but using their own experience uh, to encourage the children to consider how they might themselves enter the profession in years to come. So through a workshop, um, the students were sort of challenged to consider the current operation and maintenance of their own school. And this was, it was, it was quite uh, it was good fun to sort of watch, actually. Uh, and by the end of the workshop, the students would have understood the role uh, that their own FMs uh, do on a day to day basis. But we asked them to investigate a number of factors which contribute 
particularly to the sustainability of their own school. And this is a red hot topic at the moment. I mean, there's every day the, you know, these children, these young people, ourselves on the news, you know, we've seen Blue Planet, we're still talking about um, plastics, we're still talking about the destruction of the uh, natural resources of this planet, and talking about sort of food waste. I mean, I went to an event uh, on Monday this week, and just in the UK alone, we will uh, destroy 10 million tons of food, which equates to 20 billion pounds of money, which we are wasting. And yet, as a country, we have people who are starving, and it's just quite shocking. And I think the young people are, you know, we need to energise them. We need to get them really interested in this subject because, you know, they, they, they are our future. Um, so they were asked to sort of go uh, out and research their own specific environment and to effect the lasting impact. The students will receive handouts some guidance, which will be accessible on our website and we will send it to them. In essence, this will be a career advice and guidance, including uh, information about their GCSEs that they might choose, A-levels, apprenticeships and university pathways. Um, the guidance will also include case studies from people in FM and recent students of the uh, DEC programme, that's obviously design, engineer and construct curriculum. Um, so the whole day started with a presentation and, the, and that presentation can um, double up as a, a delivery uh, guidance as well as through cover notes and um, expanded information. So there's a 15 minute introduction as to FM and obviously we've got uh, the whole career pathway for young people to see that they can enter this at an early stage, they can enter this really sort of straight from school on an apprenticeship programme and they can develop up to an MBA and master's level to a sort of director of you know, workplace so that it's not just seen as an operational opportunity for them, they can see that there is a complete pathway and they can work right the way through. Um, so obviously we give complete guidance for people who are running this programme on our behalf with um, advice on sort of the timings, so they will have a sort of 10 minute personal introduction as to who they are, then they would sort of go through a 15 minute talk about the whole the task that we're, we're going to ask them to do. We would then challenge the children um, to sort of go out and look at their buildings, look at their environments and sort of walk around um, and look at the opportunities to improve the whole um, school environment. We will also talk about the trends that are happening in FM and say, and I alluded to that earlier, especially nowadays with um, plastics and uh, food waste, energy efficiency, etc. Um, we would then talk about uh, career uh, advice, um, the various pathways for them in your introduction to FM and say, and as I've just mentioned, um, GCSE advice, A-levels, degrees, and what the benefits of an apprenticeship are. And at the moment, uh, we sort of said earlier, there are now opportunities uh, for apprentices at levels two, so ideal for sort of school leavers, um, up to level three, four, and then six at degree level. And we've also um, created some sort of case studies so uh, how you know, the, the pathway from an apprentice up to a CEO, uh, we've got some sort of young, dynamic young people, and this is what we need to do: sort of get young people who have chosen FM as a career, and to showcase that to the young people. So this is a look at um, the pilot on the day. This is a, um, uh, imagery here from the uh, presentation that we give. So it's a welcome presentation uh, from the ambassador as of volunteers. Um, there's an overview of the eight steps of the task that they need to undertake. And then the children are sort of let loose around the uh, school to go and explore. They interview staff, they interview pupils, uh, they fill in the, um, the task sheets and bring that back. Uh, and then once they've brought all that feedback, they're asked then to prepare a PowerPoint presentation and they have to deliver that back to the class. Um, with their thoughts, but also their solutions as well. And that was really exciting. Uh, and the, the school I was um, at on Wednesday in Chingford in uh, East London, 
the 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 22 students were sort of um, broken down into sort of six uh, groups and sort of made up of three to four uh, pupils and they had to present obviously to their sort of DEC uh, teacher but also to the headmaster deputy head and um, they had a film crew in the room they had um, the the ambassadors and plus myself and they had to present to and to see these wonderful 13 year olds to stand up you know some of them more confident than others but to have that experience and obviously what we're hoping to do is the more we can get young people sort of engaging with these programs then we can work with local employee employers to offer opportunities for work experience and then, therefore you can sort of start to join the dots up so in five years time we've got some wonderful talent coming through who understand what workplace and facilities management is understand the opportunities for them understand how to study have had the work experience and they will become our leaders of the future so thank you very much everybody for listening and i hope you enjoy the rest of the um webinar today thank you okay thank you linda uh, so if anyone does want to get involved in that at all if they have any questions uh, feel free to get in touch uh, Sophie is staying on the line until the end, so if you've got any questions, feel free to send them through and then um, we'll answer those for you. Or alternatively, email us directly. Uh, if you email info at iwfm.org.uk, uh, we can send you forward information, uh, forward you information on that. Okay, uh, so next we've got Carolyn. Uh, Carolyn um, joins us from UCL and she's going to take you through her own journey um, through one through and the academic uh, routes that she's taken to get to that um, end stage of where she is at now. Uh, she'll talk to you a little bit about uh, UCL and uh, one of the options you can take through them and also the changing landscape of education and how uh, different research has now been built into the academic routes and how that is changing and um, what the new future will be on that. So Carolyn, I'm going to pass you control now. Uh, if you give it a couple of seconds, it should kick in and you're good to go. Thank you, thank you, Nicole. Um, hello, I'm Carolyn Lewis. Um, I, as Nicole said, I'm a part-time lecturer at University College London and a professional member of IWFM. Um, I attended the excellent IWFM People Management SIG on the 1st of May in London, where talented FM professionals shared their journey of how they got into facilities management and why they were excited about their jobs and their future. I personally found this presentation very interesting and powerful and I thought today um, I would share my uh, journey into FM as part of the World FM Week. So uh, bear with me and being a little bit indulgent while I go into my little bit of my history. So my journey into FM, like most people in the uh, sort of early 1980s and most young ladies of working class parents, Higher education was not in the, an option for me, but uh, learning to type uh, meant that you always would have a job, or so my parents thought. So I was strongly um, advised to go into, into some sort of secretarial role. Um, I wanted to work in the NHS, but did not want to be a nurse. So following careers advice, I went to college to do the AMSPAR diploma to become a medical secretary. To support myself through college, I worked first in hospitality and then retail, which I enjoyed. But at the time, did not think to make either job a career. It just wasn't, it just wasn't was that I thought of. On graduating college, I moved to London to work in a large acute hospital as the medical secretary, and then as an NHS events coordinator, and then a GP practice administrator. The pay was great for my age, but there was no career progression, and it was quite frankly quite boring and samey once you mastered the, the sort of admin techniques that's what you did there was no opportunity to, to put in any change or anything like that so an opportunity came up for me to become an NHS management trainee um, it was initially a drop in wages whilst I trained but it gave me an opportunity to study for the Institute of Purchasing Supply Level 6 which was a degree equivalent involving part-time evening study at college it also gave me the opportunity to work with Mike Lenser, the then Regional Director of Procurement, on an exciting project to transform supply chain management from local hospital stores into regional distribution centres and centralising uh, procurement, thus saving the NHS billions. This project was uh, the forerunner to NHS supply chain of today 
and gave me great insights on how to manage major cultural changes. It was a huge uh, a shift in how uh, NHS procured and how they managed their stores at the time. Next, I worked as a senior procurement and logistics manager in the NHS for 10 years, overseeing NHS mergers and demergers, closures of hospital sites, and the emerging third party contracting out of estates and facilities, which was occurring during the um, 1990s. With a growing frustration that I would work up to what, 18 months on large FM contracts as a procurement professional, and then on award, I'd, I would hand the contract out to my FM colleagues at the time, you seem to have no idea how to manage a third party contract in its operational phase, let alone have any supplier or customer relationship management skills. This realisation at that time led me to change my career into an operational facilities management role, again in a large acute hospital, which I thoroughly enjoyed and was my introduction to sort of FM, pure FM. Building new PFI hospitals was the big thing in early 2000 and I wanted to be involved in it. So I joined the hospital PFI project team at Maystone and Tunbridge Wells on planning the new hospital build at Pembury. As PFI at that time was so new, I was really lucky I got to work with the Department of Health's private finance unit and Mott MacDonald on developing standard form output specifications for estates and facilities and learning about strategic planning, business case development and, and essentially how FN is the heart of a hospital. Without FM, a hospital does not function. And that was again quite interesting and sort of revelationary to me and just uh, emphasised the important importance of FM. Curious to learn more, I took a master's degree at London South Bank University in planning buildings for health run by the Medical Architect Research Unit. This course had a multi-professional intake with architects, designers, construction managers and other estates and facilities professionals. It was a transformational experience for me as I had not previously been to a university and partaking in the course exposed me to the latest thinking in built asset management. We were given opportunities to visit and evaluate built environment projects as well as gaining insights to a wealth of experience from my fellow students and lecturers, which was, you know, part of, other than the talk was actually really, really uh, useful to me in my career. Uh, it, it made me grow as a person. Um, the course gave me the time and confidence to utilise my learned skills in my day to day working practices. The masters also allowed me to hone my ability to write persuasive business cases that I could evidence, along with achievable delivery plans, and gave me a 360 degree view of the whole business, which I hadn't really had an opportunity to explore before, just, just being engrossed in my day to day. Many years later, I have had the privilege of being asked to lecture on the MSc Digital um, Innovation in Built Asset Management course that is run at University College. This is run by um, Professor Michael Pitt. Um, there are other universities and IWFM training partners offering FM degrees at undergraduate and master's levels. But what is unique about this course is that the Masters examines the role of various built environment professionals through the lens of digital innovation. It's in its second year with 52 students this year, but mostly full time and a few part time students with a strong international mix. But they have chosen FM as their career of choice and have undertaken to study facilities management and Masters level. The focus of the course is wide but targeted and it touches on every aspect of building better places and spaces, from design and construction through to operations and maintenance. The course is based on operational management as well as being research led, so students gain a robust understanding not only of the best ways to work now, but also of how we can best work in the future. In this month's Facilitate magazine, there are many articles and features on the changing nature of the workplace, the skills that FM professionals need and how FM can provide leadership in this environment of change. In the IWFM briefing paper, FM and the Future World of Work, the researchers by Three Edges gave valuable insight to what members think and experience in the workplace. As Sophie said earlier, the major concern of members of meeting the future needs is the shortage of suitably educated, trained and competent staff and is a growing problem alongside attracting and motivating talent once you've got it. 
In the 2019 Occupy survey published by CBRE, two thirds of occupiers rank employee engagement and talent attraction and development as the top two drivers of corporate real estate strategy ahead of cost reductions. That frankly quite uh, astonished me because for years and years most of my role has been about cost reductions but the fact that now two-thirds of occupiers in this survey are now uh, citing uh, employer engagement and talent attraction and development as their top two drivers shows how the industry is actually changing and how people are actually looking about the outputs rather than purely the, the financial inputs. So things are moving really rapidly now in, in the uh, FM environment management. There is a need for a new generation of FM managers who are equipped to lead the challenges faced in the workplace. In that world, data, analytics, technological advantages and the emerging service culture with space service is the norm. I believe that FM professionals are those best placed to lead those changes. Studying the master's course for me gave me time out for my busy day. It gave me time to explore outside my immediate working world and to engage in conversations with multi-professional colleagues at all levels. I think by doing some uh, further education, whether whatever route that you choose, it gives you an opportunity to sort of look above the parapet and actually take some time to reflect on what you're doing and what the business needs. And that's, that's one of the uh, beauties of actually choosing to do studying at any level. And I think it is something we should be encouraging our members to do. Donald Rumsfeld famously said, and um, there are things that we know that we do not know. So I think that was a bit of a garbled message. I think it does actually have a relevance for facilities. There is so much out there that we don't really know the answers to and we still need to find the answers to. And, and the only way we can do that is to be uh, forward thinking and to explore and to look at previous pro projects and to learn from previous projects, learn from innovation. It is that culture of continuously learning and development that I think we need to encourage in all our members. Um, the work that's been undertaken by IWFM to encourage 11 to 18 year olds to choose FM as a career is brilliant. And um, there should be as many varied routes of the profession as possible. Uh, obviously, this master's course is one. As I said, there are a lot of other different routes as well. Estates and facilities management was not my career of choice back in the 1980s, but I really wish that it had been. And I think this is an opportunity for those children of that, those ages to start thinking about what they can do and what they can be and actually choosing FM as a, as a profession of choice. Thank you, that's the end of my presentation. Um, if you have any questions or want, want any further information, my details are on this slide and you feel welcome to email me. Thank you very much. Excellent, thanks Caroline. Hi, it's, it's uh, Fraser back again. I've, I've sorted out my technical issues which were, uh, which were dogging me before. Um, that was a really interesting uh, presentation. I think it demonstrates how uh, people's careers can, can develop through workplace and, and FM. Um, I thought it was interesting uh, picking up on obviously the research that we've done around the importance of employee engagement. I think um, I think really that's a, a cornerstone to, to a lot of what we're trying to do uh, within Workplace and FM about becoming more people focused. And, you know, there really is a need across business to uh, focus on uh, recruiting and, and nurturing and then retaining uh, the, the best talent. So, um, you know, we, we do talk about things like the, ta the, the, the war for talent, um, but, you know, the it is going to be of critical importance that there's going to be a lot of professions now uh, fighting over uh, the, the, the best young people as, as they come through uh, and how we can make sure that we get the best talent within Workplace and FM. So uh, thank you for that, Carolyn. Uh, really interesting. So uh, we're going to hand over to our, our last presenter of the day, uh, which is Adrian Raby, who is from um, the British Training Board. Uh, they are an organisation uh, that help uh, military uh, personnel, uh, both in while, while they're serving, but also while they're leaving uh, to tr transition into civilian roles. So Adrian should now have control, so I'll hand over to Adrian to talk us through his presentation. Thanks, Adrian.
Thank you, Fraser. Um, and hello, all, and um, thank you very much for letting me um, be on the panel for this um, fantastic week of, of FM. Um, as it says, I'm currently uh, Chief Executive of the British Training Board, but um, in a previous life, um, I was in the military for 22 years and got all sorts of weird and wonderful qualifications out of there. But unfortunately, when I left the military, um, people didn't understand what I did. And I didn't really understand what I did either. So I, I went about a process with um, other members who were within our organisation, as they are now, to try and work out what military qualifications were and how they looked in civilian street. Um, so being uh, an ex-soldier, I do like a bit of an agenda. So um, I'll take you through that as we, as we go through. So there's um, four main points I'm going to look at. First of all, who are we, as in who are the British Training Board? Um, what do we do? The, uh, a couple of case studies from um, soldiers who have been through the, the process and all sorts of future projects we've got going on as we go through um, over the next few years or so. So first of all then, the, uh, the British Training Board itself, well, we're a community interest company, which means we're a not-for-profit. We look at the security and education and facility management and logistic areas as a whole. Um, and then we provide services solely for the armed forces and the police community at the moment to look at what they've done in their career and then change that into a career of choice so that they get the most of the qualifications they've done and also they move into a vocational second career that they actually enjoy and want to be productive in. Um, British Railway itself was formed in 2014 where we launched the product, we were looking at um, how to evaluate So we, we did a three-year pilot program, which was completed in October 2017. And during the evaluation project, the, the main things that came out were how it's supposed to be employer-led. So um, during the review, we looked at and helped over 2,670 serving personnel, uh, veterans and their families, and we credit them to all different levels of qualification. Um, by the end of the evaluation, you know, we, we took, took stock and looked at, back at it. We've done over 16,000 accredited qualifications, delivering across all aspects, everything from logistics, security, facilities management, hospitality, um, and so on and so forth. So with this in mind, we looked at um, how we could make this more streamlined because the, some of the uh, organisations we were working with didn't actually understand what military qualifications were. They were, didn't realise how it worked in their awarded organisation impact, like um, higher education authorities well, didn't understand what, what soldiers did and when we were trying to explain to them it was like we were speaking English and they were speaking Italian and nobody really knew what was going on in the middle. So from there we um, looked at how we could do it ourselves. We did, we opened our own awarded body um, and we're now the awarded body of excellence providing accreditation for public service sector organisations. And then moving on from that, February, 2007, uh, well, February 2018 we launched all of the UK services across um, six different sectors um, and the BTP services as they are at the moment were, were then pushed out. So what do we do as an organisation? Well we do, as I've mentioned, we provide bespoke skills translation services to personnel to train in-house qualifications in the nationally and internationally recognised accredited awards, certificates, diplomas and degree exemption pathways. We work with various different organisations, the IWFM being a massive one we're working with to deliver the um, facilities management project at the moment, which is going really well. Um, and hopefully that will be you know, up and live within the next few, few weeks to months. Um, we also convert military specialities into civilian accreditations and civilian careers. So for instance, with facilities management at the moment, what we're doing is we're taking the guys who just think that they do logistics, um, retraining them, re-educating them, so they do understand that the, the, the process they're doing is just part of facilities management and then invite them to go and speak to major employers uh, within the industry to see if it's a, a career of choice and if it is linking up with them from there. We use specialist training providers um, who work under our body as the Armed Forces Community Academy. And um, what they do is the top up modules that are required for the military authority. Because basically we just bring them from military to civilian. The guys would have a, a disadvantage because they don't understand the commercial aspect of it. Whereas if you give them that Bit of um, transition, they, they suddenly realise yes that you know when you talk about facilities management, you're not just talking about the guy in the stores with a brown jacket on. You're actually talking about dealing with contracts, dealing with external contractors, um, looking at how to develop relationships with other companies and organisations. Um, and we only use specialist training providers for that. Again, across the sectors, normally the training providers we use are veteran-owned um, to keep it in the in the in the family, so to speak. 
But again, working with outside agencies now, again, like IWFM, we're looking at other training providers who are specialists in that field, just so the guys and girls get the most out of the qualifications that they're going to get. Uh, and leading on from that, talking about um, creating a career of choice, we also run a guaranteed interview scheme. Um, I don't know if any of you hear of the Employer Recognition Scheme, which is a gold, silver and bronze award, which is um, devised by the Ministry of Defence itself. And it gives employers um, a chance to be recognised for what they've done with the armed forces community. So there's a thing called the Armed Forces Covenant, which companies sign up to to say they've got a commitment towards um, military services and helping veterans uh, and their families achieving work and, and the such like. So our guarantee interview scheme, we've taken all the employers from the Silver Award, which is currently standing at about 1,700 companies across the UK, and we bring them to task to say, yes, would you offer this individual a guaranteed interview um, if your job's available and they're fully qualified? So we send the individual in to the company, um, they have a chat with whoever the HR or FM person is, or whatever role they're going for. If that company then comes back to us and says, yeah, this person is fantastic, they've got the right attitude, but they haven't got the correct qualification, we would then skills translate that qualification, um, give them the, the relevant membership or award or diploma, whatever they need to get them into that role. We don't charge for the service, it's not a, a, a recruitment tool, it's literally us going in to make sure that the individual can leave with the best um, outcome for themselves after doing you know, service to the community uh, and to us as a country. So uh, that's what we do. Leading off from that, uh, the next thing we do is look at a couple of case studies. There's um, one is a guy who's a, a friend of mine. I actually joined the army with him um, when we first joined back in 1990, and he stayed on a bit longer than I did. Um, so he's a bit of a, a bit of a wild character. But we'll go through him first. The guy thinks I'm part of. There's one more after that, which is a, a case study um, from Cradle to Grave. Okay, so. Hi, my name's Al Carter. I uh, just wanted to say I attended the British Training Board um, uh, two-day package. Once I was uh, realised I was getting out of the army, rang up my friend Rab Raby, um, delivered him all my qualifications, uh, went down there, attended the courses and came out with a fantastic result at the end of the day uh, with some really good viable um, qualifications now that I've put into my CV and getting a lot of interest. So once again, thank you very much for your fantastic job down there. Cheers guys. Hi, I'm Sergeant Steve Jones. I joined the army at 16 to escape an unfulfilled and unstable upbringing. During my service, I immersed myself in the military institution and positively responded to the influences of teamwork, discipline and comradeship, all of which served to give me a sense of identity and belonging that redefined me as a person. I was deployed on many combat operations and in spite of enjoying a vocation that I was clearly well suited to, I felt the time was right to try my hand in Civvy Street. This decision was influenced by the desire to reduce the effects of separation on my girlfriend and new baby. I completed 10 years service, I was eligible for the full resettlement package but came through it with no clear idea of what job I either wanted to do or best suited me. Whilst access to generic transition information helped me with CV and interview techniques, this alone was not enough for me to be able to successfully identify a vocational direction of travel that I either understood or that I owned. As an ex-infantryman, I felt I lacked transferable skills of some of my peers leaving from the more technical parts of the army. After a frustrating period of undirected job searching and failed applications, I was offered a job which was not what I wanted but felt compelled to take because of the responsibility of my family situation. I wasn't challenged by the work and felt underwhelmed by the people I was working with, who didn't seem to share my own perception of selfless values and standards. On the one hand, I felt I lacked guidance and on the other, that I was not working at the level of responsibility I had enjoyed in the army. Furthermore, I struggled with the commercial reality of profit over people. I was conscious that this situation was affecting my home life, I was drinking more, losing confidence and my motivation to change was being eroded by a sense of isolation. It is likely this situation would have got worse had I not found the BTB website when I typed military skills translator into a search engine. On arrival in the BTB community, I became immediately aware of activity by individuals and others like myself. 
The design of the B2B community site allowed me to view a spectrum of relevant and empathetic information that encouraged me to first, stay on the site and then, explore further how this initial engagement might continue to benefit my situation. My next stage of inquisitive exploration was managed through a combination of positive inducement and restriction, a process that culminated in me committing to sign up as a BTB community member, itself simplified through one-click social media integration. Once a member, I became aware of a more ordered and supportive approach to transition. I now work as a facilities management trainer at a college in South Wales. The BTB changed my life and I can't thank the team enough. Moving on then, um, our current and future projects. Uh, first of all is the one we deal with at the moment, which is a um, positive direction. Um, I'm not sure if any of you live in Wales or whether you know much about Wales as a, as a country, but um, in 2015 we launched the first Green Initiative Act in the world really, um, and it was called the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act 2015. Um, we're looking at the principal guidelines of the circular economy. Um, circular economy, in a nutshell, basically at the moment we're living in a, a linear economy where we um, dig things out of the ground, we use it, and then we put it back into the ground in landfill. Um, the way that's going at the moment, we're using 1.5 planets worth of resources. So by 2050, uh, we'll start running out of stuff. So the circular economy is brought in to look at how we can retain, re-educate, um, and reuse. So it's a very much a green initiative, but we're taking that to a, a level where it'll be retraining, re-educating service leaders and vendors into the circular economy. Why is that so important? Well, within the context of the circular economy, there's a thing called the Circular Economy Club, which is now with 170 countries signed up to it across the globe. And it all boils down to one thing, which is facilities management. If you've got the right facilities management in your company, in your buildings, you're going to save the environment. If you don't deal with the, the, the environment, i.e. you've got bad air quality in, in your building or you're leaking energy through your windows or you've not done the, you know, the correct processes or built it to last longer, you're going to cause more um, resources strain on the planet. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to get 100 uh, service leaders and veterans trained in a new emerging market utilising the supply chain of major contractors. So we're looking at putting, like the... Um, the energy management system for um, buildings where you've got A to G. We're going to try and do that with, with the circular economy. So buildings will have a, a health um, a health check, really. Uh, we'll look at using new technology that will last longer uh, and stay in place longer to hopefully build a greener planet to make sure that the, the Earth is right ready for our next generations. Um, and that's, that's what the initiative is about, really. So... Um, that's me. Well, thank you very much for um, for listening. And uh, again, if you have any questions, believe with you. More to ask me, but um, thank you very much for your time, and I'll hand you back to Fred. Thank you, Fred. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks a lot. A um, really interesting presentation and a, um, a great demonstration of, of the good work that you're doing. Um, and obviously, um, you know, shows how, um, you, you know, the challenges for, for military personnel um, as, as they kind of move over uh, into civilian employment. But um, obviously a great source of uh, potential talent there uh, moving into FM. Uh, thank you to all our uh, presenters today. Um, Hopefully you got a real flavour of um, the, the, the work that we're doing uh, within the Institute to, to really promote workplace and FM as a, a viable career uh, of, of choice for individuals and for new talent coming into the profession. Uh, I think what it does demonstrate today is that, you know, there are varied routes into FM. Um, you know, it, you, you could come from a, a kind of more softer skilled background or a more harder skilled background or obviously uh, coming in, you know, routes in through, through the military and the forces as well so um, we're a very broad church uh, within workplace and FM so uh, there's, there's opportunity for all and you know if, if there are any of our members who are um, who, who are on today and, and some of what we've talked about has, has maybe sparked a bit of interest then, then certainly get in touch with us uh, things like the the schools program you know we, we are really keen uh, to, to roll this out wider uh, and, and really engage with uh, young people and, and schools to, to really promote uh, the opportunity with, within workplace and FM. 
Uh, we've only got a, about a minute left. We've not had any questions. I'll, I'll maybe just hang on for, for 30 seconds just to see if anything does come through. Um, just to say that the slides and the recording of, of the session will be made available afterwards. So uh, if there's anything you missed or, or anything that you, 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 you didn't quite grasp, then, then certainly it will be available and you'll, you'll be able to uh, read and watch at your leisure. Uh, doesn't look like any questions coming through, uh, so we'll wrap it up there. So thank you to our, our panel for, for your time today, uh, really enlightening uh, presentations, and hopefully we will see you all on the next IWFM webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you.